Good afternoon. Welcome to our council committee meeting for June 28th, 2022. Uh, at this time, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional territories and the oral practices of the Blackfoot Nation, which include the Siksika, the Kainai, and the Bakani. We also acknowledge the Sajina, the Stony Nakoda First Nations, the Métis Nation Region 3, and all people who make their homes in the Treaty 7 region of Southern Alberta. We are making this acknowledgement to demonstrate our continuing efforts to work together as we strive for reconciliation through increased and collective learning. Okay, any additions or deletions to the agenda? Okay, Amanda. Thank you. Through the Chair, to Mayor and Council, I would like to delete item number five, Recreation Facilities Lighting Retrofit Request for Tender off of the agenda, please. Okay. Um, then to the agenda here. Um, First of all, kindling as a land use, and Gavin, okay, Gavin, you, it's your floor here. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Through the Chair of the Mayor and Council, this evening we have a kindling as land use discussion item. This has come about as a local entrepreneurs have looked to put this use uh, forward in the, t the city. And because it has not been previously defined in the bylaw, we'd like to have a discussion with council about whether or not it should be brought forward as a land use and whether or not that land use or how that land use should be regulated if it is introduced into the bylaw. I will give a brief background to this, um, this discussion item, then I'd like to open it up for council feedback, if that's all right. So uh, in my report there, you'll see that kenneling does have some back history, certainly at the BAPS location, there was an approval in 2005, and that location is about 80 meters from the nearest home. And as such, the outdoor kenneling portion of that was approved, and that'll give you some insight as to what you're looking at. Should private business be having indoor or outdoor kenneling? The land use bylaw currently has two definitions, pet grooming establishments, which is essentially the care and um, washing and grooming of animals uh, and that kind of thing, as well as veterinary clinics, which do uh, allow some overnight accommodation within the building only. You'll note that the vet clinic is allowed in certain districts, as is the uh, pet grooming, and the districts tend to be commercial and industrial in nature. As well, we did have in 2019 an appeal of a home occupation where an applicant had been decided to do this, this type of kenneling use in a home situation. And as such, the appeal board recognized that they could have five dogs if under the animal control bylaw as pets and therefore they granted the permit with the five dog limitation. Uh, this home occupation is still in operation. So from other jurisdictions, I pulled together some inf interesting information just to give you a rounded view of what is out there. From the most, uh, most municipalities look at this as an animal care major type of use. And most of them do define it in their land use bylaw for the idea of kenneling as well as the associated pet grooming ideas. They do distinguish though that the breeding is breeding of animals is not part of their definition. So that's something to note as we go forward in this uh, discussion. So as a sample definition, we have there for you that uh, this kindling used means a development for the purposes of boarding small animals, normally considered as household pets for periods of greater than 24 hours includes outdoor enclosures, pens, impounding or runs and exercise areas. The land use may also include training, grooming, impounding and quarantining facilities, animal shelters and retail sales of associated products. So from there, we look at the city of Leduc who's put together some extra rules surrounding this use. And there you'll see that they've included the vet clinics along with kennels and pet care. And from there, they've indicated that there should be adequate protection to suppress annoying emissions from the pens, as well as that the use be equipped with indoor exercise runs, and that's for the health of the animals, that they're not just penned all the time. 
And they also have separate air exchange systems if they're in a building that shares heating and air with other businesses. They go on from there and they stipulate that uh, these kennels are not to be allowed in residential districts and that they are to be 150 meters away from any residential development. I will talk about distances a little bit more in a bit here, but uh, certainly from the point of view of what a dog does produce a sound, you're talking between 85 and 122 decibels of sound. And inside of a building and with multiple animals, that can echo. So that can get up into some pretty, um, some decibel levels that are, are somewhat <clears throat> harmful to the neighborhood or situations where they're actually harmful to human health. So that's something to consider as well. You'll note that the overnight accommodations in the, the bylaw indicate required indoor exercise runs, but it doesn't mention outdoor recreation uh, or outdoor kenneling. And so there is a distinction in some cities between indoor and outdoor kenneling, and that's something to be considerate of. Outdoor kenneling is more common in rural municipalities. In Newell County, they have outdoor kenneling allowed as long as you're 300 meters from the nearest dwelling, that's a thousand feet. And then you'll also note in my uh, submission this evening, concerns about dogs um, that they have adequate space. So one municipality there, Ladue County has indicated what the space per dog should be as far as the exercise run. They've gone on and also stipulated distances from adjacent properties and from property lines. And from there, they go on to describe various other aspects, including how the hours of operation would work if you had outdoor kenneling, stipulating the hours specifically that they shut down the outdoor operations between, between 10 p.m. and 7 a.m. daily. There, the next section I've included in this is a concern with the dog breeding side of things. And that gets into the, I guess, the illegal world of puppy mills where the accommodations are not ideal. And for that, some consideration is given to whether or not breeding should be allowed in these situations at all. If you do consider breeding in, in part of your discussion, it is something that is unique and therefore, I think the most important part of the bylaw that was uh, submitted is from Willow Creek, is that there be yearly inspection by a veterinarian, a veterinarian of me a doctor of veterinary medicine. And that yearly inspection report comes back to, the, uh, back to the Municipal Planning Commission to make sure that, or the Development Authority, to make sure that everything with this operation is kosher over time. This evening's recommendations are that we just have a, a conversation with council about this and that you sh if you should move forward with this as a use in your land use bylaw, we'd like to set up some criteria and properly understand whether council wants this to be an in indoor only situation or you will allow outdoor kenneling. And when a draft bylaw is produced, hopefully that draft bylaw will be in compliance with your animal control bylaw and there, that there's no overlapping definitions that uh, mislead the public as to what is intended. And should council direct staff, I believe that this could come back as a draft bylaw to you if we don't quite have consensus on all the items and you wanna see the written document as presented. So I'll turn that back to you, Mr. Chairman, for a discussion amongst council. Thank you. Okay, any questions? Go ahead, uh, Councillor Idris, yeah. So with, with, with the appeal situation, um, with, first of all, what was the, gro the, the grounds of, refer you, you mentioned the idea that it's just like having pets at home, but it's a, it's a business. Does that create some sort of now, if, if we come with a bylaw, um, does we have to take that in consideration? Does that impact something that was before that? How, how does that appeal situation, the situation that's already going on now, impacts this? Yeah, so the, the current situation in the municipality is that under the animal control bylaw, you're allowed a certain number of animals. As a business, the business would certainly seek to have many more animals than five. And as such, they would necessarily need to come through the municipality for that approval. And it's important that the public who could be the neighbor to this business 
has been afforded some consideration. Now, whether or not this use is considered a permitted use, which is a bylaw or a permit in right, that everybody that applying for it gets the permit, or a discretionary use, which would be my preference, that the discretion is processed through uh, the development officer circulated to neighbors, making sure that they understand where this thing is, what it is, and whether or not um, they have comments regarding that. Uh, and then we apply the appropriate uh, decision-making powers through the MPC. So if that answered your question, I hope so. If not, I'll have to just try to catch the rest and, of it. And with this law, we are, we are basically looking at the idea of uh, like, not anything else besides planning, like the idea that they're just staying there, taking, being taken care of, so that will, will not impact the other uses, the, 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 the veterinary and, and the protection and, and the other ones that have Right. Been. Yeah, those other two uses, they have their niche, they have their, their ability to provide service. And this, this would be a new service that certainly from the point of view of the community, if somebody's going away on holidays, they want to be able to leave their pet with somebody that's reputable and that um, from that point of view, they can leave it for the time period which they are away and then return and pick up their dog. So it'll be a comings and goings of dogs, different dogs at different points in time, different people showing up and dropping off. And that could even be just for a simple day, you know, can't be home with the dog. Somebody's got to, got to leave it somewhere. Uh, so that's the type of use this is. It could have impacts to adjacent property owners, certainly. And, and other pets besides dogs? That could be explored. Um, I think mainly with dogs, it's the noise they produce. Um, if you understand the, the nature of a cat, I don't think they could scream loud enough to make it a nuisance to the neighbors. Um, perhaps that is something that sh that could be included in this type of business. There are ones around Lethbridge where I'm living that certainly cat um, overnight accommodation is part of what the service does offer, but I don't think it has the same negative externalities as dogs do. Thank you. Okay. Councilor Prentice. Yeah, so this bylaw you're looking at changing, obviously some uh, <clears throat> new business that wants to come into play I think here and I think the only thing I see wrong with this whole thing is, is the distance between residents and that <clears throat> some of these locations are way too close <clears throat> no matter what you try to do with it so I guess that's going to be the big criteria with this whole thing is distance yeah and that's where council has to have that comfort level for the introduction of this into the bylaw what is that distance as I mentioned, you see the upward distance in, in County of Newell at 300 meters, even Willow Creek, 300 meters. Sometimes in rural areas, sound carries much, much more in the, in the distances where there's nothing to block it off. Uh, but certainly in a neighborhood setting, you could see that sound carrying 175 to 250 meters is what some of the reports I looked at. And so the sound will carry and then that number but do you want to be from a home for this type of business is very key. Anything, Ray? No, I was thinking about the distance as well, and uh, especially the number of uh, animals you'd probably be looking at. So, so you have that one that opened in 2019 and it's still operating. So uh, I would assume that they have now, I don't know if you looked at numbers of complaints, but I would assume that they've got the noise under control there. I know BAPs can get pretty noisy during the day, but I've never noticed them being um, allowed at night. So uh, uh, things generally been working out on that smaller scale. Yeah, I think scale is something also to consider is just how many dogs. Um, BAPs certainly has to close, uh, has to have the animals indoors overnight. So there is a restriction there. And that's, that's, that's quite typical as the bylaws that I did review. Most of the time there is evening hours where, yeah, the animals have to be in at a certain time. Um, I didn't see a lot of documentation as to the control of the number of dogs. Certainly Willow Creek did intend that there is a separation 
between a, a few number of dogs being kennel, kennel category one, and then more dogs as a kennel category two, um, perhaps with more scrutiny on the category two versus the category one. Yeah, I guess uh, I, I would probably see this being set up in an, in an industrial area or on maybe at some distance from the periphery of a residential area, but uh, I don't think we'd want to see anything at all like what we have like with yeah. maps right now. I'm just kind of curious, like you mentioned a few other cities like the city of Leduc and Red Deer, where would they have the, would they be in, in an industrial area? Because I, yeah, I agree with Council Jessica there. I, yes. I don't think we'd want it anywhere, even a, uh, um, a thousand meters, if a dog is barking, that's, and getting out of hand, especially early in the morning, I know there were time limits, it would be pretty annoying. Yes, Mr. Mayor, primarily, yes, these are in industrial areas. And I did a little exercise to measure um, certain distances. So there is enough land in your industrial park where there this could be introduced and, and work and not affect the uh, neighboring residences. And that's all the way up to the 300 meters. There's still land that would work. Uh, but certainly, I think from the point of view that the commercial side of things, most of your commercial land is much too close to a residence to allow any proper setback and therefore likely would exclude all the commercial districts from this use. Okay, uh, Council Idris. So, the I haven't seen it myself, but I understand that some municipalities also have it indoor in an urban setting. Um, is first of all, what do they how how do they do that? And then is there some sort of mechanisms to control noise, or or is there some sort of proving that you can do to to bring that lower? Yeah. So some municipalities did introduce the idea that you should have some soundproofing, and I do th I do think in the examples I did provide that that was something that they looked at. And if it was strictly an indoor situation, uh, the distance, it seemed that they were reducing that um, versus the outdoor situation where you have outdoor pens. Uh, here in Lethbridge, there is one that's indoors and it is quite close to residences. I didn't go over to see whether or not you could hear it from a certain distance, but that's something that should be investigated. Um, certainly from the point of view of being indoors only and close to residences. And that could be a setup for a category split where one kennel category allowed it is allowed for indoor only and one for outdoor and indoor. Again, distances matter. So back to Councillor Prentice's uh, notion that distance is the most important thing. Okay, so I I think we're in agreement that it should be, well, in the land use bylaw, but I think the rules would have to be, that there have to be designated areas of the community. Like, for example, they'd have to be in the industrial area and the distance would have to be far enough away from any uh, residential area. Right, is that right? Yeah, yeah. And the other thing about, uh, um, what was the other one here? Um, do, 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 do you put limits and would there be limits then on how many um, animals you could have in a kennel? There certainly would be a limit from the point of view of if, it, if they were taking on an existing building, given the need for exercise areas and pens, that would limit them. Now, whether or not you went to strict limitations and you said that you, you know we didn't want to see any more than say 15 dogs in one location uh, or whatever that number may be, that, that's certainly a choice uh, of the municipality to, to enact that. that uh, Beyond that certain number of dogs, maybe that's too many. It may not be something that's conducive to the handling of them in a certain location. So there is going to be physical constraints that will limit the number of dogs unless you're building a new building and it's all, in, you know, it's warehouse size in an industrial park where the number of dogs does could increase. Um, so limitation could be looked at, certainly. So do you put all those things in the uh, land use bylaw, like... Um the uh, uh, where they can uh, run uh, says washable building material um, insulation. I, yeah, that must be for uh, the the indoor one. But no, for the outdoor one, like for example, the pens, the rooms, exercise runs, holding stall. Uh, yeah, it says soundproof. But yeah, and certainly um, hours of operation. Uh, do you control that for an indoor and outdoor one too? 
Yeah, the hours of operation typically for any business is a certain time period where they wouldn't actually be taking on new clients during the day. I think hours of operation for outdoor is important that they should relieve any barking and bring the dogs inside. I think especially from the point of view that the dogs need to be put to bed at night, that they shouldn't be left outside in their pens, that that wouldn't be humane. But um, so certainly hours of operation to control the outdoor situation is is key. So I think we we wanted in is there anything I'm missing we're missing that we that should be in there that we're missing? Well, I think Mr. Mayor is, is, is the bylaw that we got now even the bylaws nothing ever reached into it but we give them special permit to operate all these so we have a bylaw but we're given special permit to everything so is this bylaw going to end up being the same thing you have a bylaw set up then we end up giving special permit anyway so sometimes wonder about your bylaws whether they really fit the bill or not so are, are you talking about the one where we allowed the uh, one person at five yeah this one at five for instance actually even baps almost i don't think reached the criteria you're supposed to but oh, okay. it was permitted anyway <clears throat> so when you set up a bylaw if we if we set bylaws up and keep making them and never follow them give special permits i'm suddenly wondering why we waste a lot of time on bylaws <laughs> Yeah, I think what Bill is alluding to is the ability to give waivers. Um, so it could be something that we eliminate that as an option. Um, that if you want to strictly hold to that distance from residences, that you can write it in such a way that there is no waiver of that distance. County of Newell, when I was helping cover one time, um, we had a bylaw come forward and they couldn't meet the distance from the residents. And council, this was a rezoning for this type of use, and council stopped it be right at the first reading. They didn't even let it get past first reading for the rezoning because they could not meet that distance to the residents. So they were very harsh in that situation, but I think it was warranted. It, it made sense. So, uh, council president, what would we do, like for the the two existing ones, the one with the five dogs and BAPS? Do we grandfather that one in and then anybody else comes to be really tough with them then? Well, I think they're grandfathered in right now as far as yeah, that goes. Yeah. But if you're going to set up a new one to meet that criteria of 1,000 feet, that's like a block and a half away. So the average block is 600 feet. So I can't think of a commercial area in town where you'd be that far away unless you go out in the industrial yeah. park. So See, that's what I'm saying. We put in all these regulations and we turn around and, and wave them for everything we do anyway. So yeah. are, are we... Sometimes I feel we're beating our head against the ball with bylaws and we don't follow them anyway. So. But, but at the other end, I mean, we still kind of need something. Like if we designate an area like the industrial park, you know, um, and somebody wanted to put one, let's say, in uplands, we say, no, you can't do that. You'll have to go to the industrial park. Then. Yeah, like the, I got no problem with the dog things. Just, they got to be controlled. Yeah, yeah, no, I, yeah, I, I agree, yeah. Okay, Alicia. <laughs> She's going to add to it here. <laughs> Sorry, through the chair to mayor and council. I just wanted to add to it. So what, what Gavin is suggesting is that we add a section into the land use yeah, bylaw yeah. and that we only allow it to be discretionary in certain land use districts. And I think his suggestion is industrial. So basically, um, they would only be allowed in industrial. They would still have minimum setback requirements from residential, dependent on council's feeling on that. And any application if it wasn't an industrial, we wouldn't be able to approve right. and would have to go through a land use bylaw amendment yeah. to allow it, so. Okay. Does that, um, do you respond to Bill's uh, concerns then about? Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, are, are we, um, okay, go ahead there, Ray. Yeah. No, just one, one more thing on the noise control issue. So even in industrial areas, there will have to be some kind mm -hmm. of controls on noise. Uh, whether they're inside or outside, so because it can be just as annoying for business as it would be for residents in the daytime. Yeah, is that right, Gavin? That'd be true, right? Uh, the the noise, even in in an industrial area, there'd have to be controls on that. Yeah, we're, we're primarily concerned about residential in yeah. the industrial park. If we made it discretionary, certainly we would circulate to the adjacent landowners and get feedback. Uh, some of them may not have a concern, but if they did have a concern, say it was a quiet office and they weren't expecting this type of use, they could at least provide comment and give the MPC some feedback, and then it's discretion whether it gets approved or not. Okay. Okay. Do you have enough to go on then? 
I think for a draft, I'd like to bring the draft back to yeah. council committee, I think, just to make sure that you guys follow what we're putting down on paper. Okay, so Alicia, is that good? I think so, yeah. I think, are we all in acceptance or agreement with the 300 meter setback, though, from residential? Is my, what I'm hearing? Gavin, you too? <laughs> I'd like it further. <laughs> Go ahead. I don't. Yeah. Well, the three hundred meters, like you say, one block is six six hundred. No. Yeah, 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 yeah six hundred feet. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. You're the dog owner. Is that? Yeah. Should should that be more than three hundred meters? From a residential area, though, right? Again, and and in, and I'm my understanding would believe would be that we would only allow it in industrial zones. Right. So yeah. we do have some industrial zones in Brooks that could be close to residential, and therefore, then we would have to follow that setback requirement and discretionary in that it would have to go to the municipal planning commission. Yeah. I don't, yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Uh, draft it up there, then we can kind of work uh, from there then. Okay, okay sounds good? good. Okay, okay. Okay, thanks for your time this afternoon, Gavin. Thank you. Anything else? No, I'm going to leave it there. Thanks. <laughs> oh, okay. Good. Okay, thanks for your time. Okay, on the agenda next, Sandra Habermill, uh, Habermill. Sandra Haberman Melville, come to the table and turn on the mic. You can sit in the middle there, Debbie, if you want. Okay. Thank no. you, Mayor and oh, Council. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, first of all, we ran into a little bit of a glitch today. So there was a package ready for all of you, and they are behind locked doors at the bulletin as we speak. Okay. So I'm, we'll get those available to you first thing in the morning. We'll get them over here so that you guys can reference them and uh, apologize that in advance. So uh, Debbie and I have been working on um, a little bit of a, a request to lower the speed limit on the downtown streets. Uh, downtown Brooks has some concerns regarding the speed and the traffic noise. Uh, the current speed limit is 50 kilometers an hour and that would be for sure along 2nd Street in the downtown core uh, first and then I think on 3rd it's actually down to 30 because the John Ware School, is that third? The John Ware School is there, and so I think it's, oh. it's got a 30. Oh, oh right, oh, yeah. oh, oh, right, that one, right, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah. it's, got, a, it's yeah. got the reduced traffic there. So there are some areas that have the reduced traffic. Yeah. Um, one of the, the first things that has come to our attention over the last little while is that um, the previous, um, in previous years, the patios were brought to downtown Brooks, which I think, being a business owner of the Steaming Cup, <laughs> was a fantastic idea. I love the idea of making Brooks more vibrant, and um, tourists love it, and it just looks good. However, I have noticed over the last few years that I have, um, there are less patrons using the outdoor patios, and most of the concerns are that it's too noisy and they feel unsafe on the street because the traffic is quite fast, or if it's not actually going the posted speed limit, it's gunning to get through the red light at Bank of Montreal and uh, Decor Home. So either one direction or the other. So it becomes a real noise issue mid-block, and the appearance of busy traffic and noise is disconcerting for the the patrons on the patio. Um, I've had discussions over the last few years about that. I, I personally put up a lattice work to try to give the um, sense of a little bit more privacy and hoping that that might help with the noise as well. It doesn't. But uh, there are other, um, besides myself, people that on our downtown Brooks board um, business revitalization board that have the same concerns. So, uh, Debbie, if you just want to to share a little bit 
about one of your concerns. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today. Um, I've been downtown now nine years and love it. I feel like I'm part of a family, but I do feel that the last four years in particular, um, it has gotten out of hand. It's noisy. Um, I have some gla glass shelves with displays on them and literally sometimes they're wobbling off of the shelf. Between the base, the speeding, the gunning it, and I understand it's because of the roar of the noise of the echoing off both sides of the building. The exhaust, uh, it, even the clients will be, which is sitting in a back room having a service done, they're kind of turning their hand going, wow, he needs to turn his music up a little more, or, you know, comments like that. So the clients are aware of it also. Uh, we also, in our studio, deal with a fair number of senior clients. And unfortunately, not all of our taxi drivers choose to pull right up to the curb. So they're not into the, right up to the curb, so they're kind of into the lane. And if they're getting out, if they're getting out to help these clients to get their walkers out, um, they're going around and sometimes, I had a lady last summer, the distance wasn't uh, large enough to stand out of the cab onto the street, but it was too far away to step out of the cab onto the sidewalk, and she went down. And she was bruised and bleeding quite, quite badly. Uh, so these are things that I've just noticed, and they don't seem to be going away. And it's, it, it's a safety factor, and it, it's just concerning because we have talked to the police, I do believe it was three or four summers ago, there was a, a couple of uh, gentlemen from the detachment that would walk through the downtown periodically. I felt their presence made a difference. It was suggested uh, to go around and get a petition. But I just felt that if we could come and plead our case, uh, and I, it's my fault with the uh, handouts, uh, they were closed before I got there, but we will get them to you. And there is some good valid uh, statistics that do back up what we're saying. And the, the comments are coming from people pretty much in three block area. Credit Union has had a concern because of their doing U-balls down there. Um, Bank of Nova Scotia, it's another bad corner. And where the 7-Eleven is, I don't know how many people I've he heard that they just about had their toes run over trying to, because they're trying to beat around the corner or beat through the light before the when it's, the light has changed for the pedestrian to cross. Yeah. So, um, thanks, thanks, Debbie. Um, I, I believe you should have received, we, we talked to Mohammed about this, there would have been um, an email that came from Amona Patterson. Yeah, yeah, there was actually, I got a, received a couple of different ones, and I think I passed them along if I, if Mohammed, yeah. And, yeah. and, and it was a similar concern yeah. about, about the speed, about the noise, about the exhaust. Mm -hmm. On the Newell Connect um, um, app, there was also um, a notification that somebody sent in an, an anonymously, I believe, but um, they, they also referenced that. And I was able to see that because I'm on the Newell Connect app in the area, and so it showed up as a concern that I might be interested in. And their concern was the speed, the noise, the exhaust, and wouldn't it be nice to make it a, a walking pedestrian street, um, more traffic, or more pedestrian cyclist friendly, a little bit more touristy. I was gonna open up, I'm gonna, I'm gonna uh, would you ever want to close that street off for good? Yes, <laughs> but <laughs> would the, not would everybody the, on the street would, feels would, that no, way. <laughs> I know, would the merchants on the street want it closed off? Because, I mean, in some cities, they become walking malls. Mm -hmm. I mean, 8th Avenue would probably be the most famous one, but other communities have done that. Council Idris, yeah. There was some other suggestions that we talked about in the idea of maybe even having it like a one-way street rather than a two-way street and, and having, uh, so it would be a one lane and then maybe like an uh, angle parking. So I, yeah, you know what, I think we looked at angle parking years ago. I don't think that, you yeah. know, and I've looked at other communities, that, you know, with the trucks and the vehicles nowadays, angle parking wouldn't work there. It, we, and we did that, um, was it uh, about a year, year and a half, two years ago, and Amy or Amanda might remember. We remember, you probably mm -hmm. remember the design. On one half, we were going to do angle parking, the other half, the one way. And then we never ever, 
I, I forget what happened with that one there. I think some of the concerns were the length of vehicles now, because some, yeah, well, yeah, like, some I, vehicles I mean, are, are really yeah, vague. You, you, it was you also- You park a truck there, you, nobody else can get through there. Yeah, yeah. but um, certainly um, I think, you know, that might've been a no, you know, not a good solution, but the one way um, has some merit. Um, a number of the merchants feel that one way has some merit. Uh, you know, going yeah. south on second, north, and then come um, in front of the Brooks Hotel. On, like on that would third, be the, yeah, yeah, that would be it the, that way, yeah, yeah, yeah. and um, that would perhaps give more visibility and more um, value to that street as well. How long so, do you think it would train the people of Brooks to know that that's just a one way? Um, <laughs> I'm just joking. It, yeah, that is certainly <laughs> yeah. that is certainly, and and actually, um, there are a number of drivers in Brooks that don't realize that that is a two-way street anyway, because yeah. I can tell you the number of times I see people coming the wrong way and then doing a U-turn yeah. in front of my business, and I, I'm i just amazed that there isn't more accidents out there, because it continuously happens. Yeah. So, the so issue, anyway, yeah, yeah so that, that was our, our, our first thing, is we're concerned about the speed, yeah. we're concerned about the noise, noise yeah. Um, we're concerned about the, the um, well, the ambiance that goes with it, but the patrons that are using the patios, we're thrilled to have them, but now they're finding it's, they, they're just not as comfortable out there because it's loud, it can be smelly, and it, it can be a little disconcerting when you're out in the middle of the traffic. And so yeah. those, were, those were some of the ideas. In the package that you don't have, we do have um, some statistics about the lowering the speed limits, the less you know, accidents, the less injuries that you'll see, um, but also that they're good for the economy because it invites um, pedestrians, cyclists, it invites people to slow down and actually maybe look a little bit about what's in their area as they're slowing the speed rather than trying to hit the light. How much of the BRZ would you want down to 30? Um, I would think from the Scotia Bank south. That that or, would or be even the fourth, preference. where the school kids where are the crossing. school kids are at fourth even. So that that's kind of what we're we're aiming for. Um, we also have a, a couple of suggestions because we don't want to just come and, and complain. <laughs> We, we had a, a few suggestions, and again, I can pass this around if you want. Um, it will be in your package, but you may remember that in our strategic plan for the um, downtown Brooks BRZ is to finish the terminus, yes. which yes. is between the Credit Union and Veterans Park. I understand that some of that is railway um, owned, and so there's some concerns as to how you can make something finish off there without getting special permissions and, and such. It's not an easy process. One of our thoughts was to turn in front of the credit union, in, to turn it into a cul-de-sac or a turnaround with a center, a center planter, quite large. So vehicles couldn't just zip, turn around, come back. They'd actually have to maneuver around a large planter with a a uh, road into the credit union parking and lot and a road hall. into the city hall back lot. But you would actually have to make that roundabout. And instead of dealing with the um, railway land that seems to be a bit of a, a hard part, is the that could be the finish. That big, large center of the cul-de-sac of the turnaround could have a Brooks. You've reached Brooks downtown. Yeah. Brooks downtown put some of the large communities and bloom planters that the city has yeah. with the same brick style. It would, it would lend itself to have something there and it might slow some traffic down that way. Um, also for slowing the traffic down and calming it would be, we've talked in the past about mid block um, crosswalks. And I know one of our, our hopes was in within um, our downtown Brooks design was to have the, um, what do they call them, the bump outs in on the sidewalk with planters and then a mid-block sidewalk. But I think there were some concerns with that because of snow removal. It wasn't as easy to maneuver around snow removal. But if uh, there's a, another picture that you'll see in your package tomorrow that has removable planters. So you put a planter 
two planters mid-block on one side and the other with a, with a crosswalk. Maybe, you know, so that it can be moved in the fall. Yeah. But as it, when it's summertime and you want things to slow down a little bit, try to make it a little bit more <coughs> friendlier down there. Um, uh, you talked about speed and the noise. Uh, the traffic one, I mean, I, I don't believe those taxi drivers should be double parking there, right? I, I'm not a bylaw officer there. I, I think that would be wrong, but... I, it I happens, would, so... <laughs> I, I, I would assume whatever. I mean, you want to make it more, uh, as convenient as you can to your clients, too, though. You don't want them parking around by uh, the Bank of Montreal and having to walk, especially in the wintertime on, on that. Thing. We invite them to park in the back, too, if need be, oh, right, yeah, or be yeah, dropped yeah, off in yeah, the back, yeah, yes. Yeah. All right, okay. Um, any other questions on, on this? Um... And also, excuse me, I, I just was also wanting to cl clarify, because we weren't even sure, is that a truck route? Because there is a lot of very large trucks that are continually using. Yeah, I don't... I didn't think it yeah, and was. And maybe Amanda or Amy can clarify that. I don't think it would be a truck route there, but you still, because trucks are delivering down there, I believe they're allowed to come down there then, the big ones. But they, normally, that's not a truck route. They, they would have to, it would have to be a destination. Yeah, where they're dropping off your beauty like products. Like if there's at your a rodeo place. and the cattle liners are going down, that's okay then. <laughs> no, yeah. That's no. when you really notice it. Is yeah, well, no, that, yeah, that shouldn't happen there. Yeah. I'm not sure that maybe the drivers even know though either. Yeah, yeah, they should know. But yeah, but then just and, a point. And, and then the bylaw officer should, should be involved in that. You know, much yeah. like the double yes. parking. You know, on that there too. No, I don't. Um, and, and I'll just go back, because we'll take this back to administration, we'll get the other stuff from you. Yes. I don't know if there's much we can kind of do this year, but the one, I don't know, maybe there's something, the only thing we can do now, because we're almost into July now, and the, your, your season's almost over mm -hmm. with, it's almost, you know, it, it goes that quick, but uh, maybe there might be some traffic enforcement. Like, if somebody is... Well, uh, first of all, the noise bylaw, because if they're over the decimal things, you can kind of, especially, you know, like if it's a big truck with a loud muffler or something like that. And actually, motorbikes are just as bad. Mm -hmm. Motorbikes mm -hmm. are probably worse than mm -hmm. most vehicles mm -hmm. now. Yeah, you know, but, uh, but, but, but there would be laws against that. And secondly, speeding uh, in there. Like if they are over 50, you know, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We, we've, we've wondered if, if that might be something that, that could happen is the, um, you know, on the outside of town where there's the radar Flashing. The flashing light um, that, that says your you're, you're going you're going too, 60, going too fast. You're yeah, going yeah. too fast. You know, as you come into town. Yeah. Um, if something like that could be temporarily put up so that it, it could be tracked a little bit downtown to see where where the the speed is happening. Um, another thing is I I did look through the city of Brooks bylaws, and I might not be looking in the right area, but I couldn't find. Um, the only, the only thing I found about the noise concerns were relative to a business making the noise. It wasn't traffic noise. It seemed that maybe traffic noise was not part of that. Yeah, I, you know, and I don't know. Yeah. I mean, and yeah. so yeah. It, if the steaming cup was making noise, yes, yeah, I would or, be, yeah. you know, in, in... Or I know in residential areas, yes. if, if my parties are too loud or... Yeah, yeah or so I, I found that, loud. but then I did find a little clause that seemed yeah, to say yeah. that this wasn't related to, you know, yeah. vehicle yeah. traffic. So maybe, maybe Amy can answer that. So uh, to address the first uh, question or suggestion about the um, speed signs, it would likely be a very difficult area to have them in because of all the vehicles parked there. Um, we also are not permitted to put any um, signage or anything like that on the Florida's power pole. So um, it would likely, like I said, be, be a difficult area to have that in. And oh, as, that's the radar? Type yes. Thing? Okay. okay. Sorry, speed sign radar. Yeah. Um, secondly, the noise bylaw we don't have anything in our bylaws about decibels or things like that um, there would be certain things under the tsa the traffic safety act that could address loud mufflers and things like that mm -hmm. but um, we can definitely have our enforcement staff um, sit down at the end there and monitor speed i do know that the community policing unit and some of our municipal enforcement officers do walk around as well so um, i can have them uh, look into that again as well okay 
Yes, thank you. So why don't we do that as a short-term solution, or for this year anyway, mm -hmm. because of the time, mm -hmm. because, and then uh, bring the information to staff tomorrow. They can look at it, then come back to council with recommendations on that. Uh, yes. Does that work then? Sure, sure. Yeah. Thank and, you. Um, uh, thank uh, Councilor Jessica had a question. I just was going to comment on the noise thing. I, I, it, it drives me crazy, too. And uh, over the years, I've been trying to keep track of what's happening in other communities. And not very many communities have been successful at regulating noise. Uh, I think a big part of it is because the difficulty of measuring it and then proving that they have exceeded anything. Uh, probably the one I've heard that's worked the best was in New Zealand where you cannot have a, a muffler system in a vehicle that is louder than the one that it came out of the factory with. But that would have to be like a provincial or a federal. Yeah, federal. yeah. That'd be awesome. <laughs> yeah, I know. But we know that's not going to fly. Okay, so we've got a short-term solution there and then bring the information. We'll look for a longer-term solution. Yes, yes. Uh, and, uh, um, for that. You can talk to the merchants if they want to close that off there. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, I, know, I know there would probably be some that would be in favor and there would be yeah. some that would absolutely not. Yeah, but, I, know, um, I, I think it was last year because I think we extended the farmer's market out that way and I, I think that's a you know, great idea to, to put out there and I think there were some uh, concerns from businesses uh, about there. But I mean, to me, even if you closed it off in the summertime, I, they, they did that in Banff. You know, uh, we were, my wife and I were in Banff, and because of the pandemic, they had to sh shove everybody outside, and it turned out to be so good in the summertime, they're not, they're, they're going to do that every summer now. And, it, and it's interesting that um, why we travel to other centres is to see something new and exciting, yeah. to go to a Banff where it's walkable, to go on a Stephen yeah, Avenue yeah. back in the day where it was walkable. When we're not in our hometown, we find those things fascinating. Yeah. We have a lot of tourists here. Yeah. Um, just because it's our own hometown doesn't mean that other people don't come here and appreciate the walkability yeah. or appreciate a farmer's market on the street yeah. or appreciate some of these things. It's, it feels sometimes that we, you know, we're in our own little boxes when we're here and we don't do that here, but we go to places and enjoy yeah. that very thing you, in you, other places. Yeah, and you know what, maybe part of the plan for, through administration there too is maybe it's something you do for next summer, you know, and just do it for June, July, and August, like close off certain streets. And then you could basically, you know, expand, you could add eight more tables out there and, and people could be drinking your fancy coffee out there then. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I knew, I know I sound so, very self-serving here, but, no, but no. It, it actually, when we have no. the comments come pretty regularly, yeah. um, it's, I mean, I think it's something that we have to, to listen to, and people are happy about the patios, but they're not necessarily happy about the traffic. So, so our administration will work at our end to see what we can do. You work at your end to talk to the merchants about we talked about, and use Canmore and Banff are the ones I know very mm -hmm. well. Whatever. The Canmore does the same thing. Banff, Banff has done it, but they just do it in the summertime. You know, and, and you know, yeah. So, I mean, there is a possibility of doing that then. Yeah. So... so. I appreciate you guys hearing us, yeah. despite yes, our um, not being as prepared as we hoped, but yeah. you'll have it in the morning. Okay, okay, good. Thanks, Debbie. Thanks very much. Yeah, thanks, Sandy. Yeah. yeah. Okay, Melanie Meyer and Serge Menzel. Come, yeah, come forward there and then just uh, hit the one button there to turn on your mic there. This button? Oh, yeah. Yeah, you got it, yeah. <laughs> Just to uh, introduce yourself uh, for people that don't know who you are. I, uh, okay. Yeah, I, uh, say your last name because I, I butchered it there, but just, yeah, <laughs> just say it the right way. Yeah, so my name is Serge Mesnil. Well, Mesnil is the, the English pronunciation. In French, we say Minil, but yeah. I, I'm good for Mesnil. <laughs> uh, so I'm the principal for the, of the Francophone School in Brooks here, Ecole Le Ruisseau. Um, Madame, well, you can introduce yourself. I won't do that. <laughs> but, uh, Hello. Hi, uh, my name is Melanie Meyer, and I'm the president of the council and the society of the the parents of the school, uh, the Francophone School. So, um, as you know, we are uh, moving into our new school. In September, uh, we're already in the process of moving, um, but we 
should have the keys this summer, which is great. And we are planning also a playground. And I know um, we are very thankful for the um, soccer field that we're going to have in the back. Um, and we are um, looking for a donation for the playground. And we just want to give you what we are asking all the community members to help us with. Uh, we, were do we were given a 250,000 um, grant from the government of Alberta, and we have um, we reached $10,000 with our society to donate towards the the playground. So, as we know, like all the playgrounds in in Brooks, they're mostly built by Blue Imp. Um, that comes from Medicine Hat, and our kids and our parents have chosen for our school a natural playground, and it will be trees and uh, wood components and everything um, more natural. So we want to bring in even bigger if we want if we can because of that area does not have as much. Um, a green space, I would say. So because of, we wanted, we wanted that also to protect us from the wind for the kids, but also to bring in the community because there's um, high rise uh, buildings with a lot of apartments, uh, new constructions, and there's no real park in that area. So um, that was our goal. And of course, 250 is awesome, and we are starting with that, and we're really happy, but we are looking to build on for also for the community around us. Um, so we, are, we made a package, and we are um, sending it out to the community members to help us out. We will do the phase one in September, so we can have that for the year, and then we would love to build a phase two and grow it as, as much as we can so we can, yeah, have that for the community as well. Yeah, so I can present the cool. playground by yeah. itself. Yeah. Cool. So yeah. yeah, this is our, our students, not all of them, but most of them. Yeah. <laughs> and the last time we've been here was before your ele elections, before COVID, and we usually come here once a year and we're looking forward to coming again for the Frankfurt Day. Uh, if we go to the next slide, uh, yeah. Okay, this one. <laughs> so this is an, an aerial view of the whole of the whole uh, school, and hmm, that's going to be tough to see from here. <laughs> um, behind the building, so in the oh, oh, yeah, the, the cursor here. So get down, 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 down. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Oh yeah. So yes, in this area, on the right, more on the right, where yeah, the yes, is, yes. Yeah, right. So this area is where the school ground is going to be, um, the playground, sorry. So we would like to develop more than this. If you can zoom out a little bit, yeah, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> okay, so you see the line, the white thin line, yeah, you're there, and that goes way to the, well, even further south. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Ideally, we would like to have trees on this line to shield the, the playground from the wind, because this area is very windy, especially in the winter. You have a very open field over there, up to the, um, the highway, and trees will be ideal for us to shield that area from the wind. And uh, the, the playground as well, if you can go to the next slide. Okay, we have, oh, okay. That, I, I added that a little that's bit a later. Bit. That's just a suggestion for a crosswalk, but mm -hmm. that's not really the main purpose of the, <laughs> of the presentation here. So, yeah, this is um, a, a 3D design of the playground, of what it can look like. It's not finished yet. Uh, so you see a natural component, it's real trees, well, re real trunks. Real trees that you see there, it's a, uh, there's a sand uh, area. 
There will be mulch as well. There's a slide. There's a tunnel somewhere. <laughs> I can't see it from there. Maybe in an, an, another slide. There is also a place to have an outdoor classroom that can be used not only by the school. Uh, this, is a, this will be shared with the community. Yeah, we can go move forward. Okay, so the whole building has LEED certification, which stands for Leadership in Environmental and Energy Design. And so the main, when you build this kind of building, you're looking for location, transportation, and every, all the things that were there, but we reached the silver rating. So it's the first step. There's gold and platinum, but we, we, we reached the silver one. Um, we have uh, managed to have the waterless urinals, 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 I'm not sure about the pronunciation, so, solar panels, and the natural playground is not a requirement, but is a nice addition to this. And we're still looking to achieve, so the, the, the planting of trees, more trees on, the, on, on this area, a swing, a natural one, it's a very specific design, and even a greenhouse and a community garden, but that's way later in the future. That's a project we have with teachers and students, and the student uh, council is really committed to do that. Um, so this is a cost estimate about planting trees over there. So if you look at the large trees, they're around 665. Some of uh, the conifer are even more expensive than that. So if you want to plant about 100 trees, we are looking for about 70,000 at least. And if we can go forward, yeah. So we are looking for local businesses, organizations that will be interested in helping either finding the trees, planting them, helping planting them, installing, installing them. Um, also, maybe a, a letter from the cities that if, if you guys support that uh, project, when we apply for grants, um, yeah, we, are, we have already targeted a few grants from banks or Canadian Tire, Walmart. They have programs that, like that for um, developing communities. But sometimes a, a letter from the city is, you know, can help building, moving forward with that. And also suggestions and feedback from you. If that's something you think is a, adds value to that area, which is mostly residential, um, there's not much commercial activity over there, just purely residential. Okay. Any questions? Oh, uh, yeah. So what do you think in your, if you got your dream playground, what would the cost be? The playground itself can be built for three hundred thousand okay. dollars. Yeah, um, but the playground itself is not really enough for us. Mm -hmm. Well, we want that area to be, you know, more even more developed than and just the playground. Yeah, in, in but the playground is around three hundred thousand dollars, and the costs can be lowered the more we work with local businesses, and if we find partners that can help. Yeah. No, but my question was, if mm. you got your dream, which is the playground... Like, Our dream? Yeah. Well, the, 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 the total cost of everything, eh, because you got a $250,000 grant, 10000 fundraise. Yeah. What's, mm -hmm. what's your... Yeah, like you said, your, the your dream, your the, dream, the trees. The, yeah, like everything included. The trees, I said, at least 70000 just for the trees. Yeah. Yeah. And the greenhouse, we haven't priced that yet. It's just a long-term project. We are, we're not there yet. Okay? It's just what we dreamed of, what we dream of that place. Yeah. Yeah. So this one is for the trees. You can you could see on the picture on the yeah. design, the three D designs. So fifty thousand, fifteen thousand. You see that is for the. Um, if you go back to, okay, yeah. Turn on your mic. There. Yeah. That's only Fif for the playground itself. Yeah. Fifteen thousand. Fifteen thousand four forty seven for the trees and fifty five thousand to plant them. No, no, this, this is the only the cost estimate for the planting of the trees on the, on the on image the, that we saw. Mm -hmm. On the design that That's you saw. the design of the mm -hmm. playground. So only for that area. We would love to plant more trees around the border so we mm -hmm. could create oh. kind of a, a shelter. Uh, and that would be about 100 more three, trees. Um, the large ones are about 10, 
uh, it's, it's about 20 years old trees, so they are bigger, uh, so that we can use them right away, so we can have them. Uh, so that's why they cost so much. Um, let's see, any other, like normally I know with the, um, what we've done with the, like, uh, we helped uh, with the soccer field and what we've done, I think, uh, is we were sort of fair to all the, you know, like, uh, we helped the Eastbrook, we helped Upland School, uh, like, sort of equal amounts on everything there. And I don't know where, it, where we go from here. I don't know, maybe you can kind of help me on this one here, Amanda, or, Maybe even Randy, like this is, um, I know this is like on school property, so it doesn't become a city park then, and otherwise it would probably go back to parks. So yeah, yeah, so I think, uh, I don't know, yeah. maybe Amanda can kind of help me on, on where we go from that. And I know with uh, Eastbrook, what they did, because that one ended up costing about 450000 or something mm -hmm. like that, and uh, again, the city helped them out much like they helped you out in Uplands. They did a lot of fundraising for that one there too. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they had, you know, in, in relentless fundraising that they did on that one there too. Yeah. Okay, sorry, Amanda. So the city could definitely do a letter of support yeah. for those grant applications. And as you alluded to that, yes, the other schools have done some, some fundraising um, as relates to their parks. Um, Definitely, we could have the park supervisor, Phil Lund, touch base with the school to talk to them about the, the playground and some of the things that our playgrounds already have within that area uh, that um, may um, have different ideas to aid them with their playground of, of what would be good to use for equipment uh, for the children, school children in that area. Um, as relates to... Um, contribution that is financial from the city of Brooks. I believe that that would be something that we would look at during our next uh, budget year. Um, it could be a decision mm -hmm. package that staff could bring forward to uh, council for council to uh, deliberate um, when we do our, our budget deliberations for 2023. Yeah, and mm -hmm. we do that in October, so we'd need a, a definitive uh, amount yeah. uh, you know, by then. But maybe um, in the meantime, uh, like, uh, as Amanda says, we certainly can do the letter. We can kind of yep. do whatever we can to help you fundraise, you, you know, on, on that. And uh, no doubt, that, I mean, any park is beneficial to all the community. It's kind of Eastbrook. Well, we say it's Eastbrook. I mean, it be benefits everybody in the Brooks mm -hmm. Newell region, you know, anybody that comes into town on that there, too. But, yeah, uh, and that would be about the, uh, the only other thing, yeah, we could do then. Like, if you come back, yep. and then the council could decide uh, on it at that point then, mm -hmm. too. Is there anything else you need then, or any other questions? No, this this was a presentation aimed mainly to inform you and also to, to have the opportunity to thank the city for helping us in that project. And the letter of support is the main goal the we main were looking thing. for here. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. So we, we we are in contact with you with GBS and a few few business businesses to raise funds. Um, turning to public money would be like the last resort. Yeah. Okay, yeah. 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 And we, we are looking for a bigger grant um, in February, so that, that letter would oh, really okay, help yeah, us yeah. out. Okay, perfect. Yeah. 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 Um, do we want a copy Enjoy. of that proposal then? Can you, you, oh, yeah. Go ahead. Just wanted to bring up the, the idea of, uh, you know, you, you mentioned businesses, but also uh, clubs, social clubs in the community. Yes, like, yes I, I have a, a connection with... Um, Kinnett's and the Kinsmen right now. The, the Rotary also. Yeah, and yeah, the Rotary, yeah. Council Idris is on Rotary there. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> as well as. <laughs> Perfect. Okay, anything else then? No, no thank, thank you, you for taking the time to okay, listen to and, us. And we got a copy of this here then, right? Oh, yeah. I can give okay, you my copy. Okay, Jenny says, yeah. Okay, yeah. perfect, okay. Thank you. Uh, thanks for your time this afternoon. Thank you. Okay, now, okay, proposed amendments to the animal control bylaw. Amy. Thank you, through the chair, to mayor and council. A request was recently received to amend the animal control bylaw to allow chickens within city limits. Currently, chickens are included in the definition of livestock and cannot be kept within the city. Uh, I reached out to various municipalities to determine if they allow urban chickens and if they have any issues. 
Black Diamond, Cold Lake, Innisfail, and Sylvan Lake all allow hens within their respective municipalities and all have a bylaw to address the requirements. So some of the requirements in the various bylaws include roosters not being permitted, hens needing to be over a certain age, a license being applied for uh, or and approved before having the hens, housing requirements, and a limit on the number of hens permitted per property. From the municipalities that responded, no issues were brought forward. Another request related to animal control, specifically feeding wild birds, such as seagulls, was also received. The residents stated that they would like to see a bylaw come into effect that prohibits feeding specific wild animals as they can cause property damage and are a nuisance. The City of Edmonton and Town of Stony Plain currently have such bylaws for their respective municipalities and the bylaw would not prohibit feeding small birds by the use of bird feeders. Therefore, administration is recommending that the city facilitate a pilot program for urban hens if council is interested prior to making changes to the animal control bylaw and further that the animal control bylaw be amended to prohibit feeding certain wild animals. If there are any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Any questions? Go ahead, Councillor Prentice. So you've had <clears throat> applications already for people wanting to have chickens in town, is that what it's? Through the chair to Councillor Prentice, a request came in through um, C Click Fix, Noel Connect, to have council look at the possibility of allowing hens within the city. Um, I know it's in, done in other municipalities, like you said, but I don't think there's any issues. And they got the laws, like you can't have the roosters because you don't want them up at uh, five o'clock in the morning waking up uh, everybody. And then the only other th th would be. Um, uh, like the requirements, like a hen house, like who does the inspection on that? Did, 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 would it have to be approved? Uh, <laughs> look, no, not through Alicia. <laughs> <laughs> through the chair to Mayor Petrie. Um, I, haven't, I haven't gone through thoroughly the bylaws. I wanted to first see that if council was interested and then review the bylaws and determine what requirements will work for Brooks. I don't believe there's any hen house building inspector that we would have <laughs> look at them it could possibly be um, our own staff yeah. so that's something we we could definitely look into and 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 see what the requirements are yeah yeah and uh, i have no problem i, I think no let's uh, take a look at it and do the draft and then we can kind of you know bring it back to council on that and i know um uh <laughs> So no, I'm going to ignore my next comment, whatever, but okay, Councillor Idris. In, in these bylaws that you have seen, do you have an like a estimate number of what will be allowable? Through the chair to Councillor Idris, are you referring to the number of, uh, they varied. Um, I can't remember the exact municipality. Um, I think they allowed um, eight, I want to say, or something. They did yeah. vary. So we would, what I would do is bring it back to Council. Um, possibly just taking the average of, of the ones in the bylaws that I've reviewed. And if uh, council is um, okay with that, that's what we would proceed with. Because it's just a pilot program, we would obviously put a time limit on it, um, determine if there's any complaints, and determine if that number is okay and, and everything like that prior to making permanent changes to the land, uh, sorry, animal control bylaw. Okay. And then the, my other question is that is there any restriction on commercial use? Would, uh, by way of selling eggs, for example? Or through the chair to Councillor Idris, yes, in at least one of the bylaws, they were not allowed to sell um, the meat or eggs or things like that. It was strictly for personal use. So again, if that's something that council is interested in, we would include that in the bylaw as well. So, uh, okay. yeah, just looking. Yeah. So these are relatively small centers, but they also have them in uh, uh, Vancouver, Montreal, yeah. Toronto, and Edmonton. And then you can have com comfort chickens in Calgary. So. Uh, uh, large urban centers are allowing it as well. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Through the chair to Councillor Jessica, the municipalities that I included here um, were ones that responded to um, a post that I created on a municipal clerk's website. So those are the ones that I used for this. Um, but there's definitely other municipalities that allow it as well. Yeah, 
and we're in agreement. We should take a look at that anyway. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, I think so. the the one about feeding um, the and I think the uh, uh, big issue is the seagulls there. I think that's the big one there. But it, and again, it goes back to what Council Prentice says. I mean, that's fine, but we need to enforce that mm -hmm. to, uh, too. The way. Yeah. So, but but you know, part of it too. I, I talk about enforcement. There's also an education there too. You know. You know. Uh, you know, we can put out on our messages. I mean, don't feed the animal, don't feed the pigeons, and give the reasons why we don't want to do that too. Yeah. So. Yeah. Uh, yesterday yeah. morning, about 8:30, uh, they were feeding them in the parking lot uh, across some uh, uh, support sites. So uh, yeah, there was quite a quite a flock right downtown yesterday morning. So. Oh. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Did you have something? Another? No. Okay. Okay. Are we good to go then on that? Yeah, no, for both uh, for both the buy, the uh, uh, the feeding, yeah, I think so, and and the hen, yeah, to go, yeah, okay, okay, and I think uh, that's it. And I don't see any media here, so uh, we can adjourn the meeting at uh, five uh, forty-three.